everybody. This is Richard Sachs. I'm your host on Lost Arts Radio. This is a really neat show for me today, and I'm glad you're with us. We're watching it in the archive, as the case may be. Uh, this has to do with uh, the background in organic agriculture, which is intimately tied up with everything to do with health, as you all know if you've been with us for a while. And for me, I got involved in organic agriculture in the mid-60s, and in the mid-1970s, I got to meet a really interesting person who influenced me a lot named Charles Walters, Jr., and I met him in Kansas City. I was driving toward the East Coast, and I got to stop there and had a great discussion with him, and that was um, of interest to me because I had been a reader of uh, Acres USA almost since it started, and that was a, a great newspaper. It was in newspaper format at that time. didn't look like a magazine, uh, but it was kind of a, a monthly thing even then, and um, it was about um, to be, it, it was something like to be economical, agriculture had to be uh ecologically sound or environmentally sound, something like that. It was really beautiful because I had started being involved with organic agriculture or horticulture in, uh, when I was a university student the first time in the 60s under Alan Chadwick, who was a student of Rudolf Steiner. And uh, we learned soon after that about the work of Charles Walters. And the whole idea was, yeah, organic gardening which, by the way, was not invented by USDA. This was way before they started it um, to kind of take over that that name. It existed long before. Um, J.I. Rodale had started uh, a magazine about it in the 40s and uh, called Organic Gardening Magazine. Um, and, and the idea was we wanted to see how it could be made large scale. And Charles Walters was one of the only ones at the time that I know of that was taking the principles of um, gardening and horticulture in, in harmony with nature and saying this could be done on thousands of acres thus the name Acres USA so um, Charles Walters is not here anymore physically but uh, Ryan Slabaugh is who's the GM of Acres USA now which is currently headquartered in uh, Colorado and I was hoping he'd be willing to come and talk to us for a while because there's so much going on that's critical for the survival of the biosphere and the planet having to do with agriculture and health and uh, fortunately he was willing to do that so I'm really grateful for the time Ryan and thanks for being here well, should be fun yeah thank you for having me and thank you for the kind words about Acres and uh, Charles Walters I appreciate it yeah in fact that might be um, if there's anything important I left out that you want to bring in about Charles or the history of Acres USA before we get deeper into it, you know, anything you want to share would be great. Uh, you know, the, the thing we always just want people to really know is you know, what you said already a little bit, which is we come at, and Charles came at, the problem of toxic agriculture, not from uh, entirely the let's save the world approach. It was certainly an economical approach. What he saw was waste. And what he saw was, um, you know, not wasted money, wasted time, wasted products, and wasted, obviously, toxic chemicals that um, didn't need to be applied. And so uh, when he said to be economical, one must be ecological. That's could, what I was trying to remember, yeah. You could say that just the opposite, too. You could say to be ecological, one must be economical. And that's why that's such a powerful statement, because it, it, it really is a 300 60 degree look at why what we're talking about and what we're teaching and why farmers when they're buying into what we're doing and they're converting over people don't convert back there's a reason that happens and because what they find is they have a much stronger business once they get their land and their soil and their the health of their crops and their food uh, at the level they want to to get it to that point is a lot of hard work and it's daunting and it does uh, take some elbow grease and that's certainly why Charles talked about it was the chemical amateurs versus the non-toxic professionals because it's a lot easier to just um, spray a one size fits all solution on your stuff and 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 you know the spray and pray approach uh, certainly has worked for a long time but uh, the farmers are really serious about it and really see long term and are really seeing the need for uh, future generations to uh, develop the farms they're developing now know that uh, ecologically is the really the only way to create sustainability and, and part of sustainability is having those next generations coming and having a good farm to farm. That's yeah, yeah, that's beautifully stated. And, and I think what Charles was seeing is that this little detail of the money part 
mm-hmm. um, which a lot, you know, home gardeners are not as tied to it as professional farmers because it's got to work for them economically. And at the time that I was talking to Charles, I wasn't too sophisticated in economic systems at all. I, and he was, I read a book of his called Unforgiven. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you remember that one. That was really interesting. And, and it was a lot about economics. And he was advocating at the time for the government to set a, a, a floor on not necessarily paying farmers to not produce like they do now, but setting a floor of prices so that the farmer was guaranteed to make enough money to live. And that was a really interesting concept. You know, what he was saying is that where wealth comes from is nature. Mm-hmm. And that he gave the example of a corn plant. You put one seed in the ground and you get hundreds out of that, out of like visibly nowhere. And that was where wealth was created. And then when the corn was processed and put into creative uses or into inventions or I don't think he was thinking of, you know, GMOs and things like that, but yeah, some kind of positive addition of labor to the product. And you could say the same thing about mining, uh, except that mining is, has a limit and the corn plant doesn't. You know, you can keep getting multiplying by hundreds and hundreds indefinitely if you take care of the soil, um, even on a huge scale. But now... I'm just thinking of looking back at that with what I've learned about economics since then and the critical importance of the free market, free market capitalism, which we don't have in this country. We have special deals between toxic corporations and the government agencies, which are all in business together deceiving the public. But if you had a real free market uh, economy, I don't think you'd have to have that artificial floor on Agricultural prices. What do you think about that? Well, you're 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 exactly right in that this is a fairly new invention. This idea of uh, supplementing our our farmers and paying them to uh, just grow the same thing year over year, no matter whether or not we need it. Um, yeah, we had a more local farming economy. Uh, it was driven much more by those local markets, and so and you uh, the challenge was you did have a little more volatility in those mm-hmm. local. It's because you had less scale, so you were going to have a little bit more of the the, the uncontrollable factors out there. But you did have um, a real relationship with the consumer and the farmer working together on those things. And so the consumers would work together. If they wanted beef, they needed to work together to find a farmer that had a cow that they could buy and split right. and work together. And so it really created a uh, it created individual marketplaces and local marketplaces and what we replaced that was Safeway and Kroger and you know city markets that came in and just created the one size fits all food model for you know the the Kroger in Sacramento California is going to look almost exactly like the Kroger in Tallahassee Florida even yeah. though the growing environments are are much different and the local food supply is much different around those areas and so um, you know it goes back to yeah we have to do something to start getting us back in a relationship with our food providers and get that respect level back um, as to where our food comes from. But, um, the, you know, the thought of just jumping all the way back to where we need to be is, is, is impossible. So, you know, what, what can we do to start to create those, you know, mini marketplaces or just to start to lean that direction so that we can get momentum going and we can get right. some. And it doesn't mean it's impossible to eventually get there, right? You right. just can't do it overnight right. because you, everybody's addicted to the drug of convenience. And right. there's a lot of toxic side effects to that drug. But most people haven't really caught on to that yet. Well, you know, they'll eat junk food because it's faster, not well, thinking that it's a health issue. Yeah, and it's, and it's addicting. You know, and that's the, I think we really right. have a realistic look that we are addicted I, myself included. I'm not saying I'm not part of that choir. Sure. Heavily Everybody fried. is in some way. Right. I mean, whether it whether it's a, a hamburger made out of who knows what, it's totally fake and it's going to kill you eventually, to the toxic farming that, wow, I don't even have to go out in the field anymore. I can have this, you know, 80-ton tractor that just does everything automatically and it's moving toward autopilot right now because there's a tendency toward robotics and i'm just going to be able to you know take it easy all day and make money right that's that's pretty addictive well it is and especially when um 
you know, really nature, uh, that's, that's that forbidden fruit, you know, whole idea of nature that, uh, it will, yeah. it can kill us too. If we, if we, if we're not paying attention to it. And, uh, I, I was interviewing, um, uh, Fred Provenza uh, a couple weeks ago, uh, who just wrote the book Nourishment, and he spent you know forty years studying flavor feedback relationships in livestock and humans. And so he, you know, I, I, I asked him the question of what's the difference between a human finding a candy bar for the first time and a bear finding a dumpster for the first yeah, time. And, you, know, right. you can probably guess what his answer was. I set him up pretty good. His answer was. It, it, there is no difference. You know, it's the same. Well, maybe if there is a difference, the bear might figure it out faster. Th- there is certainly a lot more, uh, less um, chances for a bear to find a dumpster than a human to find a candy bar, quite honestly. Yes, it's everywhere in our environment. It's a lot easier to find those those foods. And so that was really his point. Is, and then we eat those foods and we get a huge energy rush. We get just a massive amount of energy yeah. rush. Those yeah. foods. And then our body starts going, this is great. You know, let's let's get more of that. And it really that's the assignment of the chemists who designed the candy bar is, you know, understand the pleasure centers in the brain and come up with the right chemical cocktail to activate those. So people will never stop eating it. And we would never come into contact with that in a natural environment, similar to a bear would never come in contact with a pepperoni pizza in a yeah. natural environment. <laughs> All right. You know, when they do their 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 first then the next time they get hungry, what are they going to think about? They're going to think about that dumpster and they're going right. to go back. Because that, so I, I anyway, it's obviously uh, fascinating. But until we really can talk about that, we really can't talk about expecting li- large scale change. You know, in our in our marketplaces and the way farmers are growing food at some point, that that we as consumers have to figure out a way to become uh, unaddicted and to get ourselves off of that food supply line, so that we can actually build those relationships with farmers and say, give us good food, and we'll pay them. So you're involved in agriculture and economics and psychology all at once. Because if you try to just do the agriculture, maybe nobody will care because they're not looking at the addiction and the convenience issues and economic issues. And if, if regular good food is always less profitable and more expensive, it's not going to be too popular. Exactly right. Just really looking at it from a... Uh, supply and demand um, aspect, a very basic economic aspect that, uh, yeah, if you have a farmer's market and you have, you know, you, you I'm sure go to farmer's markets and how many are selling cinnamon rolls and, yeah. and high sugar stuff. Or chemical food because they know almost nobody will notice. Right. It's a farmer's market. It must be organic. Right, right. And it's really hard. So, uh, but the one with the fresh tomatoes, and certainly they're popular with the greens and the tomatoes, and that's why people go to farmer's markets is to get access to that stuff. But yeah. it, you can you can really just sit back, to your point, and look, have a psycholo- psychological experiment and just watch people, how much time they spend looking at that stuff. And they will slow down in front of the sugar, and they will... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, <laughs> that's interesting. Oh, yeah. um, and, and like I said, I'm as guilty. It, it's hard because... I'm as I'm a hypocrite. I'm as guilty as any of them. You know, if I see something that's uh, chocolate cake that looks wonderful, guess what? I'm going to probably try to figure out how to have a piece of that chocolate. Cake. Yeah, yeah, that's the design. And and I noticed in the last farmers market I was at, which was local. Well, first of all, you know, I understand that there's so many points to talk about at once here. I'm kind of my mind's jumping all over the place, but um, the idea of local food is like that's really important but local poisoned food is not brilliant i mean that's still not going to be great because it's local right oh it's like a package that's full of aluminum or something and it says lead free you know that's not the point (laughs) and part of the psychology is not to be distracted from what matters right well and and to your point too is and i'm probably going all over the place as well but uh, we have to be comfortable with our own hypocrisies as well and know that perfection is a, is a, a lot of why people don't do it, right? They want to achieve perfection and they're going to go, you know what, I'm not going to try to do that because I can never be as good as so-and-so or I can never get to uh, the way that is. And, I, and I, uh, I, I just, there's such a fallacy in that argument and that belief system that we can never make progress unless we get to perfection. Yeah. The extreme of that is people in a smoggy city saying, right. I'm just going to smoke all day. There's no point in, you know, avoiding cigarettes because we still have smog. Right. And what a slippery slope that is if you start if you start exponentially applying that to every human on Earth and every, 
human in that zip code even, you know, and the yeah. all effects on that. So that's really the hard part is um, to really understand how connected all of our actions are together and one good action or one, you know, 2% less of something or more yeah. of something healthy is, is a huge amount of, of progress if you apply it across every human in, in, on the earth. Exactly. It's just what direction on the continuum you're moving, right? right? So if you've been drinking 10 Diet Cokes a day, if you switch to seven and try not to go crazy, I think that would be great, right? Right. So, yeah, when we apply that to farming, that's a lot of where, you know, what Charles was doing in the 70s was not, um, you know, he, he was using some some difficult language, you know, calling people a chemical amateur certainly isn't, isn't going to, you know, make them warm and fuzzy. <laughs> About. He wasn't a super diplomat, right? No, no. But, uh, you know, he knew he had to poke. He was he didn't have a choir at that time either. So he had to go poke a few people in the chest to figure out um, were they even going to listen to him at this point. Right. And we're in a much different spot now where uh, organic is not something. Every conventional farmer can pretty much tell you their definition of organic, you know, at some point. And they're going to and they might not have it exactly dictionary right, but they're going to have some idea of what this is and what's what's happening with it. And so really at this point, we're, we're looking at conventional farmers and going, uh, and, and to your point, it's not 100% change. How do we do that 2% change? How do we go from 10 Diet Cokes, 8 Diet Cokes? How do we go from seven treatments of Roundup every year on your corn crop to three treatments? And right. don't notice the difference and you see some of your soil health coming back, let's try one treatment and see if you see your soil and balance that with some organics and some biologicals and some chemistry and see if we can develop these same results in the end without all these costly inputs. And then, you know, five years down the line, they're coming back going, wow, my business is growing. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, uh, I, I, I was at a conventional farm show yesterday and, and I was talking to you about that a little bit. And, uh, that's still the conversation we're having with having people is, um, how do I create a better business and how do I do this? And it is, and you know, just like anything, if it's not measurable, you can't manage it. So just start measuring what you want to change. And that's really our advice. And so if it's right. less roundup, measure that. Figure that out. Set some goals behind that and figure out a solution. And um, a lot of times that's all the, the advice they need is just something to get them going and pushing yeah. them. Well, you know, as far as the economic aspect is concerned, which you're trying to make into a, a positive motivation to do things that are also good for other reasons, what do you think about this question that comes up in farming and other and other things that, you know, a lot of people, I guess one of the things I'm, tr I'm getting to is remember when I said the package that says lead free and people just get really happy and don't care whether it's full of aluminum. You have to actually be open to what the important parameters are so that you're not left measuring the wrong thing. And a lot of people, once they get into a label or a political party or anything like that, they it's convenience to stop thinking because that party or that group lays out all your opinions what, and what they should be. And uh, then you don't have to look at anything anymore. And the founders of this country, a lot of them were, were warning that political parties would be a really serious mistake for that reason, because it would be like a high school football team. You just defend your side because it's your side. And it's irrelevant whether their point of view is correct or not. And if people could be brave enough to drop labels, you know, and, and the thing that brought that to my mind is that a lot of people on the so-called right side of the political spectrum have a really hard time understanding some of the real environmental issues because they're right that they're being used as a total scam by the other side. And the other side you know, thinks they're really into them, but they're so hypocritical, they don't understand that they're using them to serve a power they, they've never imagined that is destructive. If they could both just drop it, um, and it things would be really different. And one of the examples is um, people on, on the right side of the spectrum are sometimes open to the idea that a free market, free market capitalism is really good. But then they say, well, you know, if the poisons really aren't that great, they'll just be outcompeted. That's not true, as long as they're supported by the government agencies. So, have you encountered that issue? And, like, ideally, what should be done with a, a product that is basically planetary suicide? 
like GMOs and Roundup, or, or a number of other toxic chemicals, should it just be left to be out-competed and, and the, the GMO slogan of coexistence, you know, and, f- and they make believe it's for American freedom and everything, and they're destroying the entire biosphere. What, what's a, how should that be thought about? Boy, if I had that answer, I'd probably run for office. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, that, you know, it, it, it is interesting, and, and I, just full disclosure, I'm a registered independent, and so I, I appreciate what you're saying, that, that um, it's really hard for me personally to uh, attach to any one institution and say they have all the right ideas. And, yeah, uh, I'm gonna, you can always agree with them if they're right. You don't have to, you know, take up the complete party line, right? Um, it comes up in the farm bill, you know, I think is it, you know, in my world is where those lines really cross. And certainly there's a tug of war always between government subsidies and non-subsidies and conservation and non-conservation practices. And that's really, especially last year during the farm bill debate, that was really the two things that were at, that, you know, created such a long process and so much debate behind it. Uh, the first house bill pretty much eradicated all conservation measures behind it. Um, and, and it did that by basically saying we're going to create one baseline environmental standard for all farms across the country. Wow. And we, well, to your point, who's going to set those standards? It's not going <laughs> to be all the local organic farmers. It's going to be the, the, the ones who are creating the most waste and have the most liabilities out there about pollution. Right. So luckily, um, the folks like the you know Farm and Ranch Freedom Alliance down in Texas and other advocacy groups really got on their, uh, got together, organized, and got that bill rewritten and it was called the King and them. And I believe, um, for representative King in Iowa. And he, uh, uh, basically to make sure that locals still have and states still have control of their local food supply. And then, you know, that, um, uh, and this should be a bipartisan agreement that true independence comes from owning your local food supply, owning your food supply. If you are a dependent, you know, talk to any colonized country in the world or any country with a history of being colonized mm-hmm. and, we're going to tell you that the biggest impact, long-term impact, is the fact that that uh, world power came in and probably monocultured their farming and took their local food supply away and made them dependent on a on them for their food. And so to become so, I was down in Belize last year. Belize was an English colony for you know many many years. They became independent in 1980, and they're finally now starting to get control of their agriculture economy and, and see it as not only their economic growth, but their true key to the rest of the world. Uh, to give you a, an idea of the small country seeing an advantage out there, they see the U.S. already being written off by Europe. They see Europe writing off the U.S. as not having unhealthy food because of some of our conventional farming practices. So right. a small country like Belize, they're going to organize, they're going to get control of their local food supply, and they're gonna, they really want to become a major exporter to Europe under the idea that our food is healthier than what is grown in America. And as in, you know, as part of the U.S. economy, if our farmers don't see that as a challenge, that, that whole country they're organizing out there, small or not, to come compete with us and undermine our trade around the world because they're growing healthy food, then we're going to get a reckoning at some point where we're going to get, you know, boxed out of the marketplace by people who are doing it better than us. And so, um, you know, th- again, that should not be a, Republican thing that should not be a Democrat thing. That should be a a U.S. Uh, almost a Homeland Security Department thing. This is part of how we keep America safe is by yeah. being and owning our our local food supply. So it does boggle me that we do divide that argument into all these little subsections that we want to argue about. But the idea is how do we create healthy food that we can own and give to our citizens so that we're not dependent on uh, on other powers. So it's a, it's a, it's a tough especially to those farmers who are uh, really used to globalization and trade and that's how they make their money. That's a, that's a tough conversation to have with them. Yeah. Yeah. It makes me wonder you're saying, how do we create healthy food? But they might just kind of not relate to that because what do you mean healthy food? This is about accounting, you know, and bottom lines and how many of the big farmers out there have that as a primary objective, creating healthy food if it, if it's ever in conflict with what's the most profitable, that's well, and that goes back to the relationship, right? Who do the, who do a lot of those conventional farmers have the best relationship with? It's the grain elevator operator, right? Yeah, it's not the marketplace. It's not the customer. It's they are basically in the in that business of really just growing grain and dropping it off in an elevator, 
And so right. as long as they do those two things, they've been successful, or we've established that as success. And right. we take right. away that third leg of making it healthy food that people eat down the line. Again, I'm generalizing. There's so many farmers doing so many amazingly good things in our country, and I'm really just harpering on those who are, who are you know, part of the problem and, and not, not creating that or getting too used to, uh, uh, or really the system that's provided so much of a security blanket for those farmers that they don't really have to think about that element of creating healthy food. They get the paycheck if they deliver a certain amount of pounds of grain to this elevator, no matter what. Yeah, and the farmers just, you know, a certain amount of the food system, you mentioned the grain elevators and the entire distribution system and, and the idea that much of it is for export, um, you kind of lose touch with the idea that, you know, I, I'm i still having this problem. i got so many ideas at once that I want to get your feedback on. But um, in the depression of the uh, early 30s, late, you know, from 29 on in this country, uh, that I think was actually intentionally caused by the central banking system, but that's a se- separate issue in a way. During that time, the number of people that starved to death was minimized compared to what it would be now because of the self-sufficient farms and the fact that there were so many more of them then than now. Aside from the chemical issue, right? Now it's like a small percentage of the people have anything to do with farming. And the farming that there is is moving more and more away from diversified self-sufficient farming to factory production of a specialty, which is not secure if anything happens. And it seems to me that just like a homesteader would want to ideally grow as much of their own food as they can, or at least be in a local community within which it's self-sufficient, the same thing applies to a country. And I don't know if that's remembered very much, because you talk about Belize or a country like that, yeah, they might be a major exporter, but they don't want to be a major exporter of just one healthy food. Because then they're really in danger. Anything that interrupts that flow of international trade, including their imports, um, and they don't have what they need to survive. Right. Right. We saw the same thing in Liberia. I remember that about 15, 20 years ago, where I think it was Goodyear. Or one of the, and I probably shouldn't mention because I'm not 100% on that fact, but one of the major tire manufacturers went into Liberia and, okay. and bought tons of land and created and basically converted all their land over to rubber trees as a support. And then what happened was uh, to continue that, they had to pay off the government, right? To keep the relationships going. Yeah. And then ended up with a corrupted relationship between a, you know, a, a cap- for profit capitalistic country, and a few individuals in government and who gets left on the curb, right? Is everybody else who lives there. And so when they finally, when the government collapsed and the people took power of Liberia back uh, and the, the rubber companies left, what were they left with, right? A bunch of rubber trees. Like, what can you do with a bunch of rubber trees, really, um, in your country? You, you, yeah. you can't eat it, obviously. And so uh, they've, they've got, and they're set back 30 to 50 years, you know, before they're going to be able to get a food supply, you know, going against that country. So. Are those latex trees the kind that makes natural latex? Is that what they're talking about? You, it's a good question. I don't, I don't really know, but they, yeah, okay. I would guess, uh, I don't, I'm not sure how they make I that. suspect it is because there's a natural material that comes out of those trees that is desirable for things like mattresses because it doesn't give off toxic fumes. Right, right. But it's still a terrible diet to try to eat it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> go, go very well with the, uh, uh, but yeah, yeah, anyway, it's, it's, those are obviously extreme examples and it's, uh, but the, you know, and we can certainly see it here uh, Flint, Michigan is a good example. You know, when people think it can't happen here, uh, well, right. here we have an environmentally uh, a poor profit company that came in and it's been proven through court records and people have gone to jail, right? The corruption between the elected officials and this company to protect uh, information from the public and, and healthy water, in this case, from the public. Um, yeah. uh, and, I, you know, that's been, what, seven years ago, six, seven years ago, and they're still uh-huh. working through this and trying to get through it. And so we're you know, and, and to think they're going to get a good environment and good healthy water in the next decade is really optimistic. And so, yeah, yeah, I agree. And and in a way, it's not a technical problem; it's a corruption problem. It is right. It, it is, and it is um, involving. And you know, to bring it back to your question originally of just how do we get politics to work together on these issues? You know, that's a perfect example where 
Um, it makes no sense to me why you would, why every side wouldn't see solving that problem as one amazing political feat that would get you elected into office. And so there is some just sense of disbelief when you're looking at that. They're going, why wouldn't a whole state assembly divert their energy to solve that problem? Because it's an embarrassment for Michigan. It's an embarrassment to themselves. It's actually causing people to not want to move their move their company there, move their business there. It's kind of people are playing the state. Um, and what you see is people point fingers and blaming each other and uh, and the people on the ground are getting it done. And I, I read the recent update that I think they're they've got about two thousand more pipes to replace and they'll finally be done and it'll get done by the end of the year, which is pretty amazing. But it just shows, yes, if we don't have that baseline uh, political value system to protect our food and our water, then what are they there for, really? You know, everything else yeah. goes away. And it's it's a representative sample of a much bigger picture worldwide where the corruption versus real ethics is essentially the issue. And where that comes from, you know, what ethics means that you care about the well-being of the other people like you do about yourself. And hopefully you do care about yourself. That's a big hurdle for a lot of people that don't even care what happens to them. But you're supposed to care about both yourself yourself and everybody else and where does that come from i don't think it can come from memorizing that you're supposed to do that and it, yeah. there has to be some direct perception of why you would want to you know and I, I think that's consciousness is what it keeps coming down to yeah and community i think is the other word i threw out there is that sense of, you know when you're really a part of a community and you know that that feeling is it's really hard to uh to float away, to drift away, to get isolated. And right. That, and to, but the to quality of that community is based on its its consciousness, too, right. because yeah. there have been communities that did some not very good things. Yeah. And it, it seems like, um, in general, though, you've got a power structure that, you know, you asked, well, why wouldn't they all want to fix the water right away in Michigan? You've got a power structure that, that is full of people with some very unusual motives. <laughs> and... It's power and money at a certain level where they're willing to write off health issues and the environment and everything else. And a way above that, which most of the public really doesn't grasp yet, there's a level of malice that is not anything about money. And that's really what's driving it. And then at the bottom, you know, on the level that all of us are down in the general population, um, I think there's in a lot of cases, better character, but it, but it's kind of sleeping. And it needs to become self-aware somehow. Farming could be one one way that that manifests, but it, I think it's that general issue. Are, are the general people going to wake up soon enough to realize the power they have to change it? And it, waking up is not just reciting the bad things going on in the world. It, it's actual self-awareness. Right. And making change happen. Yeah, exactly. And actually wanting to be a part of that change. And I think that's, it's, it's hard. And you're, you know, I, I a funny little anecdote is, uh, you know, you think you're doing things well, but bringing in somebody with some fresh eyes every now and then is an amazing thing. So we hired a new person to help us with our events in our office. And the first thing she came in and said, why doesn't everybody have a recycling bucket in their office? And we had some recycling you know, buckets sitting around in the office. And it was such an easy, low hanging fruit idea. It was kind of like a dumb moment. But we had been so in our own world, thinking, you know, you know, doing things the way we always had, then yeah. we brought some fresh blood to just look at it and go, why isn't this? And ask the question. We never would have done it ourselves. And so, yeah. That's, we, a, that's we, great. So you bring in a new perspective that yeah. every, and everybody says, wow, I should have thought of that. Because yeah. this, this is an, an illustration of what I was talking about with the, the regimented thinking according to different sides. I was just listening to a group. We had a conference call about uh, people t working to try to get rid of Agenda 21, which is mostly proceeding through the U.S. under names that no one would recognize. It's a really nefarious agenda that pretends to be voluntary and then traps all the cities and counties into obeying by giving them grants of free money with a thousand-page contract that you don't worry about that, just sign it, you know. And those people have a really clear perception of why Agenda 21 is a threat to the world and America, but they think it's stupid to ban 
uh, certain plastics that are environmentally toxic because that's an intrusion on freedom. And I'm trying to, you know, they're, they're on what you would call the right side of the political spectrum. So they don't get the legitimate environmental concerns because it's not part of the script that they're reading from. And there's got to be a blending of the insights of both sides somehow, I think, for it to work. Yeah, I agree. I, it does, it's so disappointing that environmentalism has become um, a one-party issue, quite honestly. It never, it, you know, historically, it's never been that way. Um, we've certainly had parties fighting over different environmental you know, takes, and we've certainly seen sick, you know, cyclical nature of which party is standing up for what part of the environmental yeah. protections. But um, yeah, and, and I sense that that, um, and I'm perhaps putting too much faith in the future. I've been guilty of that before, but I really, I work with a lot of students and young farmers and, and, and I've got nephews and I, and I go to high school classes and I talk to them in college classes. And the way they talk about the environment is just so different than what my generation talked about that it was this, um, the environment is, is like food, water, and shelter to them. It's not this intangible thing that's out there that we can either decide to be a part of or not, you know. And so, uh, and again, I, I, I'm generalizing again, but I do sense that there is a, a sea change coming, and we might be a generation or two away from it, where we look at uh, the environment in, in a little different aspect, more of the case. And some of it is human nature, right, that we tend to only act when the floodwaters are coming into the living room. Yeah, <laughs> at the we're, earliest, for sure. Yeah, yeah. We're kind of <laughs> if it's it. not up to the television, we might let it go for a while. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So uh, I think they're seeing the, the television start to float away a little bit, and they're going, yeah. we stay here. Uh, we better do something about it. I think the big hazard with the current environmental movement is it's being intentionally co-opted by some of those people at the top levels whose intentions are destructive. And oh, I've witnessed that in in many ways. One of them is this focus on climate change. And there is clearly disruptive climate patterns happening now that we've never seen before, one of which is the polar vortex that is freezing everybody together in Chicago and places like that. Those never happened before a few years ago. But what they're missing intentionally, according to their unseen managers, is that the number one source of man-made climate change is definitely geoengineering. And most people aren't even aware that that's happening or that it's real, or what it does, or that it's poisoning the farmland, or things like that, all at the same time as disrupting the climate. And I know there's a, a group with a million members of environmental activists, uh, OCA, that we've worked with a lot, and we've had them, their, their founder has been on our show and everything, and they're incredible, fantastic people. And yet, they don't see anything wrong with the socialist approach that's being proposed to get rid of climate change, it's complete suicide for the planet. They don't understand that. And they don't get um, that climate change is being intentionally men engineered by a, a whole group that they don't even acknowledge exists. So instead of that, they want everybody to give up their freedoms give much more power to the government, borrow massive amounts of money to supposedly stop the climate from changing and make everybody prosperous and everything by borrowing it from the Federal Reserve, which is a, a monster that, that's taken away most of the value of the economy right now that's usually totally overlooked by the environmental people. And if they have that blind spot, it's going to destroy the it's going to bring a negative effect to the whole movement so the young people have to understand not just one thing not just that poisons are bad like rachel carson said because she was right even though a lot of the conservative people think that that's ridiculous she was understating the situation and it's way worse now but it's not good enough to just get that and say okay everybody loses all their rights because we need massive taxation to stop climate change that that's so blind it, it's almost beyond description we got, we got to integrate these areas of knowledge right uh you're exactly right the environmental movement has not been strong in the economics you know discussions that they tend to get uh they tend to, that's where they kind of 
decide to step their way out of the conversation and walk away at some point. And, and it goes back to where we started this conversation, right, with Charles, that we have yeah. to be able to do our real, the only bridge to the entire world. Unfortunately, I wish it wasn't this way, is money. And it, it's, it, it's got to go together. Yeah. And I, like I said, I don't, I don't love that. I don't wake up in the morning going, yay, we have, you know, money fuels our world. You know, this is not, <laughs> you know, I, I love to celebrate, but it is just, it is a common denominator that um, does cause action and cause movement in the world if we, you know, and does, to your point, get large, powerful entities moving when there's money to be made. And so if, if we can convince, to your point, that um, you know, Regeneration International, they have a relationship with OCA, you know, and I don't know if Ronnie Cummings was on your show or who you had the most. He season. was. Okay. Ronnie and, and Alexis were both on the show. Yeah, I know, I know Ronnie uh, fairly well, and he, um, uh, uh, yeah, he can get fired up. He's a great uh, podcast guest, but. Uh, yeah, yeah. And he, and he sees it as a priority discussion, right? I mean, it's really about where do we want our priorities to be as a government and as a society? And if we want our priorities, you know, Ronnie would say, if we want our priorities to be on bombs and missiles, we're doing a pretty good job right now. You know, that is exactly yeah, right. Yeah, not too bad, right. And, <laughs> and, but poison is, is right up there, right. too. Yeah, exactly. So Regeneration International, you know, he, and Ronnie's on the board there, and he, he looked at, uh, you know, that whole group is doing a four parts per thousand campaign, I think is, is what it's called. And so I want to make sure I have that right, um, where they're getting countries and cities and states to farmers to buy into. If you can increase the uh, life in your soil, the organic matter in your soil by four parts per thousand, you will offset every piece of carbon that we're putting into the atmosphere with pollution right now. Not saying that that is the long-term solution. We can't just, oh, let's all go buy SUVs because we're doing this. But there is some really simple, you know, if we can get agriculture involved with this movement and we can get farming and the healthy food with yeah. climate change, the solutions become a lot simpler. It's like yeah. when you, you isolate agriculture over here, then all of a sudden you have to get really creative and really kind of strange about some of the solutions that you got to do to, to offset climate change and, it, and carbon taxes and all these things that, you know, really just don't have any real purpose like behavior change does, you know. And, right. Uh, no, I, th I think Ronnie's like a global hero, but my, my, my point, what I would love to be able to get across somehow and I just get no response when I try to communicate this kind of thing to them and, and others in that situation is that socialism is national suicide. The Nazis were socialists. It, it, you know, that's what Nazi stands for, national socialist. And, and it, it's not just a, a slogan issue. It's a principle to understand. And that you have to have freedom in order to make anything work. And it just has to be restricted in certain areas. For example, if you want to make a ton of money by selling GMOs and destroying the biosphere, because it's well known, what it, what it, it's not needing more research on it. It's a absolute disaster with no redemption at all. It's not needed to feed the world. And ultimately, we're going to find out that neither are chemical fertilizers. And they never have been. That was Justice von Liebig, you know, know about him and as a German chemist, like Pasteur, who's celebrated as a reason for the drug industry now, um, and killing all the microorganisms everywhere that you can, Justice von Liebig realized he made a big mistake with the nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium thing. And, um, but it was too late, and it had already taken off. And, and I guess what I'm saying with that is that there are some areas that I think it's one function of government. The reason I don't go along with the anarchy thing, because I don't think we're conscious enough to make that work. Um, everybody's not nice in the world right now, unfortunately. And there are certain areas that government needs to, like the EPA, should have banned GMOs at the, on day one. And the other things that are produced that just guarantee eventual planetary suicide. But other than that, it's got to be an environment of freedom. And when you have socialism come in, you say, all right, this is going to be utopia in some form. In the current form, it means it's all organic, right? Natural, right? But the people overseeing that are not into that at all. They're into, you know, domination and slavery. And I, I don't know how to get that across. Yeah. Choice is, a, choice is a hell of a thing, I guess, right? I mean, that's really the, when it comes down to it, is that how do you expect a population to want to buy into something if they don't have choice behind it, you know? And yeah. that's... You're, you're, so that's yeah. I, you're exactly right, and I, I think it was 
Uh, you know, and Marx writes about that. You know, when he writes about communism and socialism, he writes about that you have to integrate choice into the culture, that socialism and, and communism is a phase. It's not the end-all, be-all solution. It's a part of making change happen, and then you get into uh, uh, a democratic, capitalistic environment in the end, but you use the socialist phase to set the ground rules and the fairness factors that then evolve into your open free market. It was never you're, meant you're saying Marx is saying this, right? Yeah, the, uh, Marx was always writing that communism and socialism was a par- part of the evolution of a government. It was never the end all solution or, or, and I, you can argue with that. I'm not, I'm not advocating that what he's yeah. saying. Yeah. He, but I, I hear it so mistakenly translated as uh, communism is Marxism when Marxism is really um, about trying to bring a bunch of poor people who have been uh, totally ignored by their government into a middle class and using socialism as step one. And, and right. In but in, where, where Marx and Engels wrote the manifesto, which I think is their most famous writing. Um, they were talking about violently overthrowing the existing system and stealing all the property of the so-called rich people. Right. And, yeah. right? It, may, it may be a phase, but it's a pretty severe phase. And they don't realize in the countries where they do this that those so-called rich people were providing the foundation for the whole economy and all the jobs and all the food production and stuff like that. The real rich people... The trillionaires who are way above the ones that get attacked, they're just sitting offshore kind of smiling while the whole thing, you know, melts down. There's a movement right now among the environmental group as, you know, the biggest groups that are concerned about the environment in the U.S. and I think in Europe and much of the world that is really thinking that socialism is the answer. Yeah. And in, in the U.S., there are some that are being elected to office now. Ocasio-Cortez is a big hero of these groups. And she's saying that uh, it's unethical to have people with a lot of money in America. The billionaires should not exist. And of course, she doesn't realize that she's being directed by mega billionaires to point that out. They're the ones behind it. Because then the people will be against anybody who's still successful, and everybody else gets reduced to a common kind of a surf class with utopia being overseen by the new elite. And I don't think she gets that. But OCA and the other groups are totally behind her, considering her a hero. And she's saying that climate change is going to destroy the world in 12 years, and in order to stop that, you have to take away the free market, basically. Yeah, I, yeah, you're right. I mean, that's, it's, it's, I think, yeah, and I see, I see what's happening is you, the polarization that we keep talking about, right, is that each side keeps throwing the ball further over the fence, so the other ball side has to go chase it a little bit further and just keep getting further and further apart. Yeah, honestly. so yeah, the, the people that are pushing socialism are generally quite rich, and they don't intend to change that. But they want everybody else to feel like they represent the downtrodden lower class and everything. Farmers give so much of themselves to what they do every day, and in a very much a uh, in an environment where the best case scenario is they hand their farm off to somebody at the end of their life, and they have they can they can maybe retire, and you know, and then they very quickly get to go live a life of luxury and go retire at sixty and and yeah. go so. When you know what they're giving and you know that every day they're waking up going, they could do something else and right. be, make more money or have a simpler life. Um, I think we've, we've just, we've gotten a, a really nice, what Charles built, like I said, he didn't have a choir 40 years ago, but now we have a family and now we have a community of these people who have yeah. grown up us and that we've, we, we can work with them. And when you go to our conferences and you, we meet everybody, um, you know, we all come back changed individuals to our office here because we've had the chance to spend a week with um, uh, some of the best people in the world, you know, and some of the uh, most amazing people in the world. Right. They, um, they grow food. Um, and to think that we have a responsibility to them, we don't often act like it, you know, and whether we're with acres or not, you know, we have a uh, responsibility as to at least respect them. And we don't have to know everything. We don't have to know how the sausage is made, literally. But we do have to respect those food growers. And so I think that's really what we're trying to get back to, ultimately, is what Charles started in the 70s, is uh, 
where he was going into conventional farmers and mostly conventional farmland and trying to help speak for small farmers and family farmers and help them learn about what options they have. And right. the organic right. movement grew. We got really comfortable with our with the crowd, with the choir. And so we, we've got this nice community, but we've kind of decided that we need to challenge that community to go out and get more involved in conventional agriculture. And that's not meaning go spray stuff on your crops. That's not what we're saying. But we do want them to go attend those meetings and talk about the value of biological. Mm. We do want them to go to the traditional farm shows and carry an Acres USA magazine around and say, these guys have been doing it for 45 years. They can't be completely uh, full of crap. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Uh, and help us advocate out there for this, what we know is coming and the future of agriculture and modern agriculture and the way we know for us to sustain life on the planet for us to sustain growth on the planet and to continue to be able to procreate, we have to get back to protecting how we grow food and the food supply. And that really, uh, and so that's really what we're, we're, you know, we really made it our mission starting in 2019 that we're going to um, take acres into what we used to think of as perhaps those chemical amateurs, but we we have to think of them as our friends. And we have to think of them as friends who we can help and that we want to help build a solution together, you know, in the long run and, uh, and get back to that work that Charles was doing a little more advocating, a little more, uh, explaining. Right. Yeah. I think what you just said, uh, realizing that the other group, the individuals in it are your friends is like a really major statement about perspective because if people thought that way about whatever the issue was, the fighting wouldn't really have to keep going. Yeah. We wouldn't have to be wasting all of our energy about, you know, division and hatred, which is being really pushed by the mainstream media all over the U.S. and a lot of the world right now. Any possible division is really hyped up. And that should be a good guidance for us that what we need to do is the opposite. And, yeah, you can go into another group if you realize they're humans also. They're not the enemy. Right. Well, how do you... That's, and we, I think we did. We, we painted them as the enemy a little bit. And we said, you know, that's them and this is us. And then, but when you get, when you meet them all in the same room and you see them all in the same room, you realize, right? It's that amazing. Yeah, room. that wasn't true. Yeah. It's like, that's what's done psychologically before every war. Right. You know, the, the other country is really non-human. So this has been going on since recorded history and, or before. Right. It's okay to kill them because they're not really people anyway, you know. Right. If yeah. you think, wow, that could be me and probably is me in some ways that we're all subject to error, you know, in perception. And how would you treat yourself if you were in that, in their shoes? Right. And, and, that, and that is yourself in their shoes. And what did we learn, right, when we were being raised and we were growing up, right, is to respect um, that other individual and to, to never, what, I mean, I remember when you were a toddler, right, you stomp your feet and say, I want my way. I want everything done the way I want it to be done, right? You, ever, right. you said, that's not how we behave. That's not, and so, yeah, when we get to be adults and we do the same thing, right? <laughs> yeah, and, and we have better weapons and technology at that point, too. We so think we're, we're being powerful by doing that. And no, we're not. Yeah. Right? So by the time you get really old, you should consider growing up, right, at some point and and changing the way you do stuff. Or at least knowing that it's kind of that definition of insanity, right? If you expect everybody, you know, I, I, I you know, trust me, I, and I get in trouble for this sometimes because people will call me out and say, well, you know, if it's not organic, it's not right. And it's mm-hmm. not, the, it's, you know, so how can you advocate for something that's not truly organic? And it's, it's, it's. And I, it's a great question, and I, and I love to answer it because it's really like, it's called, and, and we, we start talking about nuance, and, like, and we start talking about psychology, and we start talking about reality, and we start talking about humans as being these really complicated individuals. And so if we were all light switches, and we had two settings, organic and non-organic, and we were all walking around, and all we had to do was flip a light switch, right. the solution was pretty easy in front of all of us. And it's, it just doesn't work that way, that we all have our, uh, you know, Fred Provenza, I was, I was talking about him earlier in the show, uh, yeah. he was about yeah. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with a, a study called Carla's study back in the day, and it's really fascinating. No. It was a lady who ran a, uh, uh, an orphanage, and she had about 17 or 20 kids in her orphanage that were all um, babies or toddlers, had no exposure to really processed foods. Okay. So what she did was she uh, 
and every day uh, as they were growing up um, and she raised them, she would give them the same options of food every day. Like she, they'd have like 20, 30 different vegetables and, and things to choose from. Okay. A little bit of pay in our orphanage. And then she started tracking and tracking the data. What did they choose? What were they picking every day? And why were they picking it? And what she realized is every single one of those kids would pick a generally a healthy diet, what they needed that day. to. They all grew up very healthy. They all, um, you know, survived in an area where that was not the norm in orphanages at the right. time. Right. And she was able to put this data down. And she had scientists measuring all this stuff, too, with her and showed that kids, just like animals, will choose the the elements and the nutrients they need if they're given choice. And mm-hmm. they will all choose a different formula. So to think of that there's this one-size-fits-all application that we can say that my way, if I if every day does just the way that I do it, is going to apply and make sense, and especially when we're talking about food, and yeah. register with people is just absolutely insane to think that that's going to happen. So we have to allow people to choose this path and provide as much data as we can in front of them that's about health because we know in the end that innate thing in them says they want to be healthy. And we've got to tap into that individual so they will choose the healthy path, path, which will what drive the marketplace, which drives then what farmers grow, and it comes full circle at this point. So, yeah, it really does get down to the crux of it. We've got to figure out a way to talk to each other and get along and figure out what we have in common before we can ever expect change to happen. That's super interesting. I, th- I think it's a really important issue in general. I mean, <laughs> one complication of that, which I'm sure you get asked about, not just with organic, but then do you leave GMOs out there as free choice, for example, to take over the world if people choose to let them do that? Is that okay? Or how does that fit into what you just described? I, I don't think they would ever take over the world because I think there's always going to be a part of a resistance movement to that idea. And it goes back to what we were just talking about, right? That this is my solution and I'm going to make it fit everybody and it's going to be the best. And there's just always going to trigger a natural human uh, disagreement with that. Uh, is it going to get worse before it gets better? Probably. Um, but do we have the idea that... Um, can we, I mean, how else will we execute the change? I guess I might ask you that that back going, okay, so if GMOs and we have these large corporations and, you know, what Ronnie called a chemical cartel going out there and saying, here's here's uh, five um, companies that all they want to do is own every seed in the world. And okay. they, they okay. want all of the copyright for every seed in the world. Well, just from that announcement that they wanted to do that, created all of these nonprofits, seed banks, private movements, um, mm-hmm. I'm going, we're going to prevent that from happening. So, um, and it goes back to, you know, Dr. Vandana Shiva said something. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with her work. Yeah, she I do know about her. Uh, very powerful. And she says, we all want to act locally. And because that's what we can control, right? We have this thing that I can go to the grocery store and ask for a different type of tomato and feel like I did something. Sure. While these companies are acting globally. So how the heck are we going to fight their inertia when they have such more power and influence and money, like you're saying, we have to work together and we have to build that community uh, to work together. And I know that sounds altruistic and I know it sounds hard to do, but it really is the only path forward, right? How do we get the critical mass to argue that they are wrong and that they are, that we don't want that as an option. And, and we have in podcasts like this, you know, conversations like this, you know, we know people are listening going, yeah, I agree with that or I disagree with that. But right. the sense of, um, we're not, you know, it, it, wars have been fought for less. Heads have been cut off, you know, for less than, than sure. poisoning the food supply at this point. So uh, I think they're really walking a um, uh, no sustainability in what they're trying to do. And there's no sense that the public would even stand for it. So it's an, it's really interesting because it brings to mind the comparison. You know, I think people should be totally free to smoke cigarettes, for example. Even if it's going to kill them, and they probably know at some level it could kill them. But I really believe in freedom, individual freedom. And I think that was one of the best things about the founding principles of America, even though it hasn't fully been lived up to yet. It still could be. And so I think they should be able to smoke cigarettes. But I don't think they should be able to smoke cigarettes on a closed airplane. Right. Because then everybody has to smoke. Right. And and maybe they don't want to. 
and they they don't want you know their lungs to turn black and stuff and they should have that choice gmos in the open planet strikes me as very similar because the contamination from them even without the issue of what goes with them like roundup and things has been found in the remote mountains of mexico i mean way in the wilderness and and roundup has been found on the poles in the ice so is it really something that's just going to be worked out by people's free choice? I, I tend to think no, yeah. because by the time they figure out that it's bad, it may be irrevocable damage. It could be that now. And so it brings up, in what cases do you not go with the principle of freedom? That's a good question. I'm a libertarian at heart, probably. So I'm always going to want humans to solve the problem before government gets involved. You know, it's a point yeah. that's there are limitations to that. There's a lot of limitations to that. You know, gun control is another one. Do we really want people walking around with, you know, uh, missile launchers on the back of their car? No, we don't. That's not good. Yeah, I mean, I don't even own any missile launchers as an example to other people. But I think firearms rights are absolutely critical. And I don't think the liberal people understand that. Because in countries where these tyrants take over and they murder millions of their own people, not in a war. This has happened... 262 million people roughly in the 20th century were murdered outside of war by their own governments. And they always took away firearms rights first. Right. And I think that's really important. And the other issue with that is that in Europe where they're bringing in people who have uh, belief systems that everyone but them should die. And I know I've read their scriptures. That's really what it says. And they're coming in with these mass rapes and carjackings and all kinds of terrible things. If the people were, if the women especially that have been victimized by the thousands that you're not even allowed to mention anymore because media will shut down the discussion, if they were armed and trained, that movement of mass rapes would have been over in one day. So I think that has to be really deeply understood. And, and places like Chicago where the firearms are illegal and you have basically no freedom in that direction there, there's the worst uh, murder rate from guns anywhere in the country. So it's not as simple as it looks. And this freedom versus non-freedom thing, I, I really feel like I want to understand it better. And that's why I brought up the GMO thing. Because there's some cases where the freedom is, like with the firearms rights, it's so critical, especially when it's a corrupt government that would take it away. And, and many of the liberal people who understand more about the environmental stuff totally don't get it with gun control. And they think that if you just make it illegal, all the criminals will just give up their guns. And that's not what happens. Well, and that's a great parallel with what we're talking about with GMOs too, right? If we just right. and GMOs, how are we are we really ever going to? Now, there's not a, there's not a civil defense mechanism behind GMOs. There's just kind of waste and pollution. But uh, you know, it, it is that. So there's two kind of problems, right? We're, we're talking about how does government keep these things from becoming the only option that consumers have, right? The, option that farmers have so that we can always choose a healthier option than doing that. And then there's one, how do we get consumers to not want that stuff, right? That to not uh, Yeah, I think that's really important. Right. And so, yeah, and that's a, that's a challenge. And so, and you know that um, it's just like anything, right? Anytime government labels slaps on something, uh, think about the 80s when they put parental advisory warnings on CDs, right? What did everybody do? We went and bought the CD, right? Because it was better, uh, you know, it was, the government didn't want you to have it, so there must be something to it. At some point, so I, I just well, that's that, often true, actually. <laughs> so yeah, and it is, and so I think we just have to be real careful about you know uh, what we ask government to do for us, quite honestly, and the and, the, and the, the hope that we put behind them to make major change to happen. You know, I just I just rarely seen it that changes happen from a government perspective. You know, the, no, no. Uh, for some reason, uh, power positions attract people with different motives usually. And they're not always the best ones. I think, do you know a guy named Ed Griffin who wrote Creature from Jekyll Island about the central banking system? I know the title, but I don't know him now. He's great. He's been on our show several times. And um, one thing that he started as a project, which I think should go right along with the whole environmental concern, is trying to get people with good motives to run for office. Yes. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Yes, that that is exactly where it starts. Is the uh, um, 
all those people doing amazing work in their communities, organizing fundraisers, running their ball teams, being coaches, uh, you know, taking it, if they can take it that one step level and run for office, uh, that would really be a revolution. That really would. Most uh, of them want nothing to do with it. And why is, right? why is that? Why is that? Because of who they have to deal with. Exactly. You right. know, the, their colleagues are, many of them, in it, you know, for really criminal motives uh, combined with laziness. And either they don't want to think about anything or they're in the group that does and they're thinking how to, you know, defraud the public and harm them for money. Right. And they don't want to be in the middle of it. But you have to. Yeah. That's, it's, I mean, it's like you going to the farming meetings. Yeah. You got to, you got to learn how they, you know, and I, I had a friend who, um, uh, was, a, was a lucky enough where he was in political office. He was a county commissioner out here in Colorado. Uh, the democratic party house of representatives from the state of Colorado got, a, got an appointment in the Obama administration. So he got chosen to go sit in the house of representatives seat and fill that seat until the election was up. And so he got about a year, year and a half. And he thought this was his big break going to the Capitol. You know, I'm going to get in the, and what he learned was the hard way of, was when he got to the Capitol, he couldn't get anything done. He was a rookie legislator that was going to have to run for office again. He only had about, I think, five bills he could write. Um, every, and if he wanted any of those to pass, he had to basically sit down with somebody else and say, if you vote for mine, I'll vote for yours. Right. That, that's how politics got that <laughs> Oh, does. man. That destroys the benefit right there because you they're going to make you vote for something you don't believe in. Exactly. So he was compromised the first day he showed up. And so he, he didn't run. So he did a stint at D.C. and he came back and became a county commissioner again in Colorado because that local environment, being involved locally, was he could get so much more done. He had such a better relationship with his constituency and it was a better life. And so, you know, it was a really good story that you don't have to run for office at the senator level or the right. run for governor. It can be school board or it can be the yeah. local. Yeah, school board, water board, whatever, right? You're gonna have you're gonna have a way better chance to get stuff done at that level than if you ever run for a big office at some point uh, and making things happen. So yeah, that, and someday that, that's been that's on my bucket list. Someday I wanna I wanna I gotta throw my hat in the ring. So I'm not just all talk either. Um, I I think that would be great. Yeah, I would vote for you for sure. <laughs> I, I think sure. the the qualifications that matter are motive. Yeah. Because everything else you can learn. Yeah. Do you want to, yeah, do you want the world to be a better place? Yeah, exactly. And, uh, and when you talk about the difference between, you know, the people that come up and ask you, well, how can you be pushing for what Acres wants to do because it's not 100% organic? How do you see the, the goal difference, maybe, if, the, if there are some, between what you would see as ideal for farmers or what OCA would see as ideal or what the organic program would see as ideal? What are the variations and why? Uh, it's a good question. I, I think, you know, we, a lot of our, our readers are organic, but they do not have the certification. So okay. they're, they're doing a lot of, a lot of things, right? About only about one in 10 of our readers actually have organic certification and you know, give plus or minus on that. But uh, it's not the most common part, but a lot of them are using the organic principles to grow, to do livestock, to grow their their ranches, to grow their food, to garden, to do whatever they're they're using. And so, I think um, the idea of a government stamp on them rubs a lot of people the wrong way. That way, you're going to make me go through a process where you're going to stamp my food and say this is healthy, but you're not going to make these guys with the Monsanto trucks do the same thing. Right? Yeah, so exactly. They're, they're they're going to get a free pass to the marketplace with no labeling. But for me to get a healthy food label, I got to do all these X, Y, and Z things. So why don't, you know, and that's really what we're trying to advocate for them is let's flip that burden of proof back on the conventional toxic sprayers to show that their food is healthy and take the burden of proof off the organic folks so that if you're doing things organically and ecologically, certainly we need oversight and certainly we need some way to verify that. But uh, right now, there's so many barriers to market for those folks that it's really untenable, and there's really not value there. Um, yeah. So I think organic is just one of those terms that um, is corrupted, and I think Ronnie would agree with that with the OCA, yeah. that he's in a dangerous situation of his whole, you know, that organic brand being corrupted. Now that hydroponics is involved, yeah. he was changing. We talked about that with Alexis. It, one of the great things OCA is doing and that Alexis is really putting energy into is trying not to fully corrupt the organic standards. 
and letting people know what's going on. Because I think the organic program was started so that it could be corrupted. I mean, the ag department is one of the biggest pushers of poison on the planet. Mm-hmm. And they're totally behind GMOs. And, and they can't have the right motive for organic with that ethic you know as their foundation and what they've got is they're working in partnership with all these big toxic companies that are trying to get the standard to be meaningless so sure everybody can eat organic and still eat the poison it's perfect coexistence right well exactly and that's and it'd be you know enough about america and human nature to know exactly where this is going, right? I mean, yeah. and, that's, and we've, we've seen this happen a lot with different things in the world. So I think it's it, what we're hearing, and unfortunately, there's also a lot of confusion in the marketplace. There's so many different organic certifications and types of organic certification yeah. that it's kind of meaningless to consumers at this point because they see all these labels and they don't know what they mean. And Why so, don't we get a private organic certification agency started that has nothing to do with government? Well, and, it's, and it's transparent. It's a good question. Other, you know, my only answer to that is because then there would be just one more certification agency. You know that that you know it, it, we just yeah, but at least it could let consumers know what the standards are. I think uh, where I would like to see it go is less organic labeling and more into food quality labeling. And so can, you know, there's things, uh, and I'm not going to remember the guy. I think it's David Kitteridge, who's developing refractometers that will create labeling for vegetables to say, and, and a scoring system for vegetables and fruits out there to say, here's the bricks level, you know, and it'll be a formula that we all have to learn and get used to, but it's kind of like, a, uh, it, I don't know if you're a football fan, but how they rank college football teams where you kind of enter all this data in and they say, here's the best, you know. Right, that, right, uh, right, it's, right. It's, it's way, it'd be a scorecard. So if you had a, and I'm making these numbers up, I don't know if this will be anything close to when it gets released to the marketplace, but if your tomato scores a 9.2, and the next tomato over has a label of a 7.5, you as a consumer know, whether it's organic or not, the nutrient level in that tomato is much higher. If you combine that with organic and non-toxic, that becomes a heck of a powerful marketplace option at that point. Going Well, that would eliminate a lot of the hydroponic stuff, I think. Exactly. Exactly. Right. Yeah, we certainly know those don't taste nearly as good, and that's because they don't have the nutrient density. Right. The minerals aren't there. Yeah. Yeah, and they make them look really shiny on the outside, like the tomatoes and stuff. And the profit margin in the hydroponics is really high. Yeah, uh, but they're just water balloons, to your point. I mean, that's, that's all right. that you're eating, really, is, is that. So, uh, yeah, no, I, I think that we're, we're just on the, the verge of a lot of breakthroughs here. I really do think that in 10, 15 years, we're going to see uh, farmers sorting their carrots at the end of a supply line with these materials and so when they get bagged and put in a bag and get put on a truck that bag has a food nutrition label on it that's much different than today it's not just an organic certification yeah. it's, it's just on there like a calorie level would be or something else that says here's your so you got to have people who are running that system who are not corrupt right so at some point be and that's going to not be a local system that's going to be a national system right yeah. at least and so at yeah. some, if yeah. if that's if that's the case Somebody's good people are going to have to run for some non-local positions, too. Yeah, yeah and the USDA is going to have to adopt that as something they favor. And yeah, I mean, it's going to take a lot of work, but I, I, just from the purely consumer perspective and the marketing perspective, it's such a powerful thing that I can't imagine, uh, to your point, it, it, and just like any innovation, right? It can be corrupted for bad or it can be repurposed for good, but it is, uh, it is a breakthrough that's coming. You know, I think down the line, and I think it's directly as a result of the confusion in the organic industry that we just need, we need some more points of data out there to say what is healthy and what is not, because to your point, organic doesn't always mean that anymore. And it's right. literally watered down. And the certification is not what matters, it's what it really is. Right. Right? I mean, it could not even pass certification and be organic in the real sense, and it would be better. Right. So, well, it's, when it's, you... Yeah. When you and OCA start looking at this stuff, where are your points of, of agreement and difference on how it should turn out? It's a good question. I probably have to ask Ronnie that uh, myself, but I think, um, you know, we're, I'll, I'll, I'll put it, and this is probably um, one of the, and I'll give you an anecdote to answer that, so it's probably not yeah, a real, yeah. but um, if, if, you, if you gave me two farmers to shop from right now, and one was a fully certified organic farmer with all of the fruits and vegetables with a very successful, profitable farm, I wouldn't mind yeah. shopping there. If you gave me a second choice of a 
uh, organic farmer in Iowa, surrounded by conventional farms, who can't get GMO certif- or can't get organic certification because of the pollutions that are coming on his property. Who do I want to support, really, in the end, and who needs our help the most? <laughs> yeah. It's going to be that. That second guy. Right? That's a really good point. I, I would totally agree. And the only problem is that's not necessarily the food you want to eat. It, well, exactly. It, and I don't know how you deal with that conflict. That there's the conundrum right there, right? You know that that we want to help. Yeah, and there's and so it's it's <laughs> how do you get a regenerative stamp on that food to say you know what we are regenerating our land, so we've got regenerative status. So we're not organic yet, but we're not conventional either. Yeah. And, we get yeah, I think that's fair. It's just that you, as a consumer, sure. since your point is not to destroy your physical body, right. you want to know what's in that food, even if they are tr- really trying. Yeah. Is no, it possible in that environment? Right. And then, because if you don't help those farmers, right, what's their incentive to, to go that next step and to get there? Yeah. Right back but, into the but see, that's my point about whether or not these chemical... Uh, supplies for conventional farming should be restricted versus the freedom doctrine because the the people that are using the chemicals around that regenerative farmer those are kind of like the people smoking on the airplane that's exactly it i don't necessarily think that should be legal yeah i and and they don't either and in many states it's not you know when you look at dicamba you know that's the big uh uh, cotton and soybean um, issue going on right now where they're spraying it and it's affecting uh, uh, cotton crops across the South. Um, What's it a spray for? It, it's a it, it's basically uh, a three degrees of separation different than Roundup is really okay. All it's an different. herbicide then, right? It's an herbicide, and okay. it basically is a, is a uh, uh, and it's more airborne, so you can get a lot more foliar coverage with it. But the problem is, and it's got made with a lighter. Your model. neighbor can get a lot better coverage too, I guess. You got. It. And so they knew about this 30 years ago, and it was banned. And then about a few years ago, it kind of came up for review. Nobody was looking. It didn't get it fell off the ban sheet. It's being and every farmer warned and said, "Hey, if you start spraying this stuff, we're going to have lawsuits until we're blue in the face." And so guess what's happening right now? The spraying cycle happened the last two years, and now you're seeing you know 100 lawsuits and eight or nine uh, states already banned dicamba again because. Uh, to keep those, to they really just accelerate the lawsuits through and to get the, the farmers their money that they're owed. Uh, but it just shows that um, it's exactly what you were saying, that we have uh, a political system. And interesting fact about those states, those are all red states that ban. Okay. So when you think, so I know we've been hard on the Republicans a little bit of the right wing on the Yeah, because a lot of them don't understand the environmental stuff, but you're saying in this case they did. They're the ones leading this, that it's the Republican red states banning uh, so my state of Colorado has not banned Dicamba, and it okay. drives, and so but Kansas has, and so that's yeah, that's, very interesting. Now that should ultimately, I mean, in an ideal situation, should apply to things that pollute the groundwater too, because everybody's drawing out of that to water their regenerative farm with polluted water. Yeah, you know, they shouldn't have to do that. No, they, they should at least have to pay a fee or a fine that would go back into you know. You know, a pool to help farmers trying to regenerate or something in there. That it, well, something, that, but I don't know how you can clean up water when it's still in the aquifer. No, well. So you, you kind of have to not pollute it, right? <laughs> it's a good point. Uh, it kind of goes back, yeah, no, you're exactly right. Or, and so how do we create so many penalties for that stuff that it's not even an option anymore, you know, for, for farmers to do Well, that? right. And, and what about just the government-supported production of chemical fertilizers that always pr- pr- uh, pollute the groundwater. Because a certain percentage, even in ag school, they're teaching that, yeah, this percentage goes to the plant, the majority of it goes away in the groundwater, so don't worry about that. Yeah. And that's considered normal. Well, until it gets to, until everybody in Florida has to uh, move out of, because of the algae blooms. The red out. algae or something, yeah. yeah. And then all of a sudden it becomes like, oh, that's, but connecting the dots that that problem started a thousand miles upstream is really hard to do, you know, and that's a. It'd be nice if you could give the fertilizer companies a way to make a lot of money supporting organic agriculture. Yeah. Well, there are some entrepreneurs out there, believe it or not, that are trying to repurpose toxic algae into fertilizers. And so they, 
You're exactly right. And there, there's a way to do it. The University of Alabama actually just donated all of its campus ponds to an entrepreneur who just started knocking on their door going, I just need test material. And wow. You know, what a great idea. It is. And so he's digging in down there. I, I met him a, a couple months ago. He's just, you know, he's one of those guys going, you know, it's a waste. It's a resource. And I'm going to see if I can make some money off of it out there. So If, if it's just a result of nitrogen pollution... Yeah. That's not so bad, actually. You could process that in a way that would be all right. If it was pollution with herbicide or something, that would be a whole different issue. But nitrogen, no, I think that should be recycled somehow. Yeah. No, you're you're right though. When you get the, and I don't I don't think we have any idea what we've done. You know, honestly, there's no we you know to try to measure and set a baseline for pollutions in the aquifer would just be so hard to try yeah. to figure out. You know, but to your point, how do we just understand that we We've created some damage and we need to fix it and just, you know, and I think that's, that's the real challenge is nobody wants to react because we don't have that big measuring stick to show people at some point that this is, you know, that's right. so awful. And really. when you've got an economy that's completely dependent on poison, right. it, it's a major challenge because yeah. I, I don't wish harm to any of anybody working in those companies it's just if they if somebody creative or a bunch of creative people can come up with ways that that companies could still make plenty of money doing things that would help the earth i you know i think that would be great yeah you know uh, yeah you're, you're exactly right and i uh that's the world i want to live in you're exactly right and, and i don't uh, uh I, I i know i know the majority agree with us and so you know the question is how do we how do we stop going crazy and, and continue on the same treadmill, you know, generation right. after generation of, of, you know, last year we had more carbon, we put more carbon in the environment than any other year in history. And this is after 20 years of talking about, we have to stop putting so much carbon into the right. atmosphere and the environment. Well, you know, you were making the point that people can't just go out and buy all these SUVs, but this brings it back to the fact that we have a requirement now if we want to solve these issues which i think is supposed to be our goal and create the opposite of a polluted world something really beautiful a uh, good quality of life for everybody things like that that we have this mandate to expand the breadth of our education our self education totally the opposite of the current trend in education which is toward specialized experts in things that have no idea, they have no idea of the context of their expertise. So they're just set up to, without even knowing it, go to work for destroying the world in some great job. Right. And they don't even know because they're doing a great job. And it, it seems like the only real education, and I bring this up because I realized you're in the education business, really, mm -hmm. and, which is fundamental for giving the world a chance to, to heal. And that has to span all these different fields. So, um, I, I think I was bringing that up because in talking about polluting groundwater and things like that, um, people say, well, you have to cut down the, um, the negative energy technology uses, right? Right, right. Um, but... But what I've found out in, in this broader scale investigation is that the clean and free energy technologies that don't require any, any input have been available for over 100 years. And they're being suppressed right now. Sure. This is really happening. And we're, we're meant to be thrown off the track by saying, well, these are all conspiracy theories. Go back to the you know, normal reality that we've created for you. No, they're not conspiracy theories. They're real. I know people directly involved. And there's a, a, a medical doctor named Stephen Greer that's trying to entice, set up a system that would entice the inventors that are hiding in fear right now because of the government programs to suppress these energy technologies. This is so important. It would revolutionize agriculture overnight and everything else. And... So far, they're not brave enough to come out of hiding yet, but I know of, of some indirectly that literally are hiding, and government agencies had, according to Dr. Greer, gravity control, the ability to fly without fuel in the 50s, and they're so many decades ahead of what they tell the public. The energy issue 
And this part of what they call the climate change issue is not really just living in austerity and trying to be happy without driving your car and stuff. You don't have to do that. I mean, even without the advanced technologies, Stanley Meyer demonstrated driving a car on water all over the country in the U.S. in the 90s, or 80s or 90s, I forget which, I think was the 90s. And he was murdered as a result. And all of his papers and experiments were stolen by agents. So that's the issue. It's not a technology problem. And we could have the ability to drive your SUV 24 hours a day with no pollution if it weren't for who we have in control. So I, I'm not saying that to be cynical or negative. We, we have to positively solve these things, I think. I, I agree with you. And that's the... The real challenge is, and going back to Vandana's statement, is yeah, we know there's nefarious forces out there working who, who don't, you know, their goal is not to make the world a better place. And they, they, they have, <laughs> no, that's probably the nicest thing you could say about them, right? Yeah. Uh, they are truly just trying to extract as much out of the planet, both financially and hard materials, as they can before they die. And that is yeah. their main goal. And, uh, yeah. The discretion is okay. And the fact that the insects have almost disappeared and things like that doesn't concern them. Because their end goal is total destruction. And, you know, profitable on the way, but destruction in the end. And I think that the factions that are fighting over the exact definition of the cure need to put more emphasis on their common interests. Right. You know, everybody being humans. And we don't even have to hate the so-called bad guys. If we really do our job, we're going to end up healing them too. Right. So. You know what? And the energy industry is a perfect example of that, you know, I, uh, in Greeley, Colorado, where we're based, we are, have a huge oil and gas industry around us. Uh, right. out, so a lot of farmers east of us have some sort of fracking or drilling going on on the property. Right. And uh, when a ballot item comes up to establish a safe distance between a oil well or a drilling rig and a house, uh-huh. that conversation doesn't, isn't a conversation about, what is the safe distance between a drilling rig and a house? The conversation is, are you pro oil and gas? Or are you anti oil and gas? Wow. And that's, it gets divided here. And so you see all these yard signs in front of people's yards going, I am Colorado oil and gas. And they, we know that they're supporting they're They're against that amendment. But so the conversation gets lost entirely, right? We're, we're no yeah. longer talking about how do that we That is just, brilliant psychology though. It I is, mean, right? Who thought up that? campaign that's really smart yeah because it makes anybody who questions it look like they're against prosperity and the benefit of the state and all these things exactly exactly and, and what gets left behind is what public health right that gets yeah. them because um we we always decide to put public health against our economy and have these two things fight against each other and i'll be a broken record going back we know and people like charles know that they're not mutually exclusive, that to have a good, strong economy, we have to have a good, strong environment, and we have to have safe places to live, and they're, they have to work together. You know? Yeah, and prosperity doesn't require poison. Thank you, yes. That's you know, I think that's, that's one thing about the current U.S. president that is not understood because people are either totally against him, which includes a lot of Republicans, or they're totally in, in favor of him, which is his base, individuals that appreciate his motive. Because his, with logic, if you drop all the partisan junk, his motive is clearly good. He's sacrificing his whole life quality to try to help the country and bring prosperity. But he has no apparent clue that bringing in the Internet of Things and all these t- really dangerous, toxic industries, yeah, they're good for prosperity, but they're suicidal for the planet. And... And there is a way to have prosperity and freedom, and like an extension of what Charles would say, right? He had ecology and, and uh, economics. And so you could add all the other aspects as well, freedom being one of the big ones. You don't have to have socialism or whatever kind of control you're talking about, or massive government, or hellish amounts of debt and ultimate control of everybody by the Federal Reserve because they're the debt holder. Um, You don't need any of that. You can have a government that is a hundredth of the current size with freedom, but one of the things the government does is it says, 
make as much money as you want and keep it yourself, but don't do it by destroying everybody. Right. There's got to be a system that works like that. Well, and, and you're right. And I think, and it, just as we've been talking to, how many times have we mentioned government, government, government setting the standard? And, you know, maybe we need to be the standard for the government and not have the standard be the government setting the standard for us at some that point. That was supposed to be the idea of this country. Right. You know, right. That, that's where people, I, people over the community, over the state, county over the state over the federal government being the lowest on the totem pole right no exactly and that's you know i, I think of you know just because dicamba is legal yeah. does mean you have to go use it or you should go <laughs> use it you know, and that's, that's yeah. the, the real challenge behind it is, is why do we I, let government set our standards for i live in a town that's supposed to be this really conscious place you know in arizona and uh they just flood the stores buying roundup as fast as they can stock it just spraying it everywhere because it's it's government approved and it's convenient. I mean, who could argue against it? Well, and, and they know uh, they they promised they promised the fallacy of a silver bullet, right? Just buy this one right. thing and you're you, you're good, good to go. And we know that that's just not how nature works. That's not how ecology works. And for an amateur gardener, part of me is like, hey, if it, it, if it gets them growing something, is it bad? There's some positives there. It, if it makes it, yeah. It, it, Success, and then can they find organic later behind that and get more involved with it? But my issue is more with the Home Depots and the Lowe's, where they put all the organic stuff way down at the end of the aisle, right? Right. And shove it in the corner, and they put Roundup as the big. Yeah, uh, and you know that the employees are breathing it because yeah. anything if you can smell it, you're breathing it, exactly. and it's just flooding the whole section. And so. let, let me tell you, as a gardener, that bio, uh, I grow a lot of stuff. I never use Roundup, obviously. I never have to. I've never yeah. had one year where I've ever gone, boy, I wish I needed Roundup to grow food. Like, it just, if you don't even think about it and you don't consider it an option, you don't need it. You just don't even need yeah. it. That's, well, the other belief, you know, that comes into it subliminally is that physical work is bad. That's one of the core beliefs because that's why you need Roundup. Yeah. Otherwise, you actually could Pull out the weed or use a hoe. Yeah. I, I mean, yeah. it's possible. I, I always love, people will call us every now and then to go, I've got, I just got a new acre and it's covered with brush and it's about waist high brush. What's the best organic way to pull that brush, to get that brush out of the, the, the acre? And they hate the answer I give them because it's literally, you take your left hand, you put a glove on and you put, your <laughs> right hand, and you put a glove on and you just start yanking because you can burn, you can, you know, use water, you can flood out plants, you can do a lot of things. Yeah, but there's really only one way to truly eradicate that plant from your land is to make sure you get the roots out, you get everything out, you get it by hand, and right. uh, you do it without you know tilling the whole thing or just uh, you know dropping a nu nuclear bomb on it at some point. Right. Well, and there's also this huge you know beneficial thing of um, grinding it up if it's dry. Once it's taken out, if you grind it and spread it, the mulch effect is really neat. There's a, you know, Elliot Coleman, obviously, right? The, the famous grower out of Maine, um, gardener and grower. And Elliot's got a great story. When he first started farming, he yeah. had he had an acre and he knew he wanted to get that acre going. And he was dirt poor. He's a former ski racer. And so he kind of just like didn't know what he was doing. He just bought this land in Maine. He sits down and he uh, realizes that and it was full of rocks and tree stumps and, you know, every problem you could imagine with a piece of land that he wanted to start planting on. So yeah. he realized he could do one fiftieth of an acre every day was what he could clear. And so okay. he, did, he did it for 50 straight days. And guess what? At the end of 50 days, wow, he had his acre cleared. But it's that sense of, to your point of like, it takes a special individual to have that first day where all you get is a 50th of an acre cleared and to right. go, all I got is 50 more days of this and then I'm done. You know, Right. And I didn't even have to go to the gym on those days. I got lots of exercise and sunlight. Exactly. It was and great. He, even had a reporter from New York come and who all his neighbors started talking about this crazy guy out chopping stumps in his yard and 10 below degree temperatures and doing that. So he had a reporter come by to take his picture. And there's an old picture of him with his little axe sitting there just chopping up stumps oh, wow. in, in the seventies. And Ingr it, inspiring. It was so weird that, yeah, they had to do a story about it. This weird guy out you know, chopping up his, his, his yard. The other thing I would love for farmers to get educated about, maybe you guys could do some of this if you feel like it is, um, the incredible benefits of rock dust yes. for the soil. Yeah. Right. 
Um, and I, I'm interested in the economics of buying a grinder, how mm-hmm. much that would cost, making that cost effective for larger scale farms. And I think it could become that. Yeah. Um, because if you have a source of rocks, like a, a riverbed, uh, where you've got a wide mineral spectrum in the rocks, and you take those and grind them up into baby powder fineness and spread them, um, that's exactly what nature does in ice ages. And during the time when the glaciers run over the rocks and they grind them up and then the wind spreads it, and it's got enough mineral fertilizer for the next 15,000 years, or the extent of the interglacial period, why not just do that ourselves? I mean, I think that could be really important. What do you think about it? Well, I think you're exactly right. How many? What do you, what do you learn as a beginning farmer, right? You walk your field and take rocks out, right? You go pick, yeah. pick rocks out. Yeah, God made a mistake. They made rocks. You know? Exactly, right? But we know that that is a fallacy, right? That those rocks are actually helping hold the soil structure together. They're helping feed, uh, that, that they're, they are helping feed minerals into the soil when it rains. And yeah. uh, those minerals are what's triggering that biological life and providing an environment for the biological life to thrive. And uh, there's, uh, and I can't, I'm not, I'm gonna massacre this, so I'm not even gonna try, but there's an old technique that they use in uh, Ireland uh, and kind of the, the old, you know, UK area and those island countries for agriculture where the, you'll see all these um, limestone uh, silos everywhere. And the limestone silos uh, were made from the rock on that land. You know, they'd collect the land and they'd build these silos up. And they really did feel like um, those, and they believed at the time that the silos were really channeling nutrients from the heavens down into the fields. And this was their portal for the gods. To right. Them. Sounds like a biodynamic principle. You got it. So what they would see is all of, so around these limestone towers, they would get really high yields and high grasses. And then as the further away from the towers, they would de- decrease. Well, right. that wasn't really the gods, right? Pumping in nutrients from the heavens. That was the fact that they carried all these rocks across their fields and piled them there and put them there. And that limestone was actually providing minerals and nutrients into the soil. So they were, yeah. dead, that, that was a great agriculture practice. They didn't quite have the science right. But they were on to something. They knew that there was some truth. Yeah. So, I mean, if you guys ever get a chance to, and you want to, to let people know how the economics of producing your own rock dust would work, I think that would be super interesting. That is interesting. We should we should look at it because we're certainly seeing a lot of companies get into that. And they're usually mining companies that have waste and they're going, yeah. oh, we can do something with this waste, not just. Uh, yeah, they could sell the dust by the ton. Exactly. Especially exactly. if it's more than one just type of mineral, you know, if it's yeah. gravel or something like that. Yeah, biochar but, is the same kind of way, you know, where biochar is just waste. But it's my yeah, way. I don't know anywhere for people to tell farmers to go for information on the economics of producing and using rock dust. I don't think anyone's done that. No, I don't think so. I think, you know, there's some, like I said, there's some old books by it. And even, you know, Charles had written a couple back in the day about, uh, and with Phil Callahan back in the day about, you know, rock science and, and rethinking the, um, uh, how we really rethinking how minerals are used in the soil. You know, that's the closest thing that I can think of. Um, but, uh, yeah, you're right. There's, there's a, there's a gap there, but I am seeing, um, like I said, mining companies, there's a company called Azamite that we work really closely uh-huh. with, uh, yeah. doing dust applications. Um, and they're having a lot of success because A, it works and B, it's a very cheap, uh, affordable material. To yeah. They need to be doing, somebody needs to be doing it on a scale where farmers with thousands of acres could use it economically. Yeah. yeah. It, I, since we're getting close to that, it's getting there because I, I like I said, it's, uh, really in the last two years, I've really noticed that there's just a company up here from called Intrepid from Denver that just drove up the other day and they, they run huge mines in Utah and Denver. They oh. they one of their employees to try to figure out their organic world. What can they do? So he drove up to meet with us and just learn more about organics and just kind of see what, what if he could learn anything. So I know that there's a lot of people at least peeking over the fence, you know, looking, going. What okay, you? good. That's it. Really encouraging. Um, I guess one of the things I wanted to not forget to ask you is that it it seems to me for agriculture to really start blooming again in the U.S. and other places, you know, showing an example here that could be copied, there have, have to be more people involved in agriculture, more smaller farms that are um, able to make a living, you know, on, on not millions of acres, and something that would attract young people to get into it. And right now, 
I think young people in general are discouraged from having anything to do with agriculture because, A, it's physical work, or it could be, and they're ta- taught that that's not desirable. Um, you should be in an office somewhere being a boss over a lot of other people so you don't have to work. And the ideal is to go off and spend your time at the beach while you own the company, you know, and the work is is not, you know, really appreciated that much. But what's the situation for people that young people that would like to get into organic farming, whether it's certified or not, just really producing wonderful superfoods for people to eat and making good money at it. Is is there an option for them? I mean, it, what's open or does it look discouraging or what do you think? What's happening right now? Um, if they're I, looking at that as a possible profession. Um, stick with it. That's my biggest advice is, you know, and in, in think of the equation. And my biggest encouragement is there's no cooler job in the world than being a farmer. So uh, if anybody tells you the exact opposite, they don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, um, I agree. There used to be a saying for, for, for many years in this country, right? You were either a farmer or you had to work for somebody. And so, yeah. you, know, yeah. are, you know, it's this slide. It, it, we, all, we all have to work for somebody. We get this. But, you know, you're, even as a farmer, you're working for that consumer or that marketplace or something. But... The idea is, yeah, you don't have to uh, do what I'm doing right now. I'm sitting in an office and uh, uh, be confined in an office all day. And there's a lot of liberty and uh, independence with that. Um, there's an energy in, energy out equation that I wish more young farmers would understand. And, and just young, uh, I wish I understood that too as a young person just getting into my career, no matter what that is, which is when you first start your career, the energy in that you're putting in is going to be exponentially more than the energy you get out of it. So whether that's the paycheck, the food at the end of the day, uh, that you're going to be learning a lot, you're going to make mistakes, you're going to feel dumb some of the time. Uh, people are probably going to tell you to stop and to stop doing it and that you're wasting your time and you're going to get all these roadblocks thrown in front of you. But if you're really called to it and you're passionate, that energy you're putting in, you will start to get that in the end. And you just have to get through that phase those five or 10 years are getting started. Um, I'll give you Elliot as an example. You know, there he was in 1971 chopping trees in his front yard just to provide some food for he and his wife, really. And now he's a book author traveling the world who runs uh, a farm, a four seasons farm in Maine, growing food 365 days a year in one of the harshest climates in the U.S. And he's a multimillionaire. And so to think about uh, the leap he's made in his career just based on the growth of organic farming and sticking with it and doing it. And he's got, uh, uh, there's another guy I met down in South America who, who was an expat, same story. First few years, he's wandering the jungle, and finally the old lions down there just took pity on him and took him in and just taught him a few things and uh, got him set up. And now 30 years later, he gets to go out every morning and pick bushels of food for his family without doing a lot of work. You know, he's got 500 different varieties of plants and vegetables growing on his farm, it's all, uh, you know, pigs are helping uh, fertilize it out there. He doesn't eat the pigs. They're just part of the family farm pets that he has around there. But he's built his permaculture system, and now he gets to travel the world. He has a school on his farm, and he's loving life. Um, but he certainly didn't start that way, and it's hard. And when you hear them tell those stories those first few years, it really is discouraging, and it really is daunting. But if you do it right, you invest in the soil, and you put the effort in, uh, and you build your your your, your community around you, you know, you find those experts that you can go to, those older farmers who've been doing it, Right. Uh, you know, it, it's going to happen for you. And, and if you put, if you do the right behavior and you do the right things, it will happen for you. And that's just the confidence I want to give everybody. And if you need case examples and people call you, send them to us. We've got so many farmers all over the world that would be more than happy to give time and energy and talk to a young farmer and say, wow. here's some advice and some help. And so it's an it's amazing industry to be in because people want to share their knowledge People want to share their information. People really do want to make sure that uh, that next farmer over is as successful as they are. Um, I, I didn't know that, that you, you actually have a network of farmers that you're in communication with that are willing to talk to people just starting out. Is that true? Oh, yeah. Come to our conference. We have our shipping um, clerk, who's now our salesperson. The last year he started, he was 23 years old, graduated from Montana State with a, a biological agriculture degree. Um Found a few acreages, you know, acres in Northern Colorado that he could just start chopping stumps up on and start building his plot. He wanted to jump on board with acres and just learn a few things from us while he's starting his farm. And so he came to our conference last year and he got to meet all those people and he got to, to meet all those farmers. And 
And he, he couldn't get a word in because of how many people wanted to grab him. Going, Here's what you should be doing. Here's what you should be doing. Have you thought about this? And have you thought about that? And That's I, great. Wow. It, 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 the biggest advice is there's a community here waiting for you that wants to teach you, that wants to help you. And you, if you're afraid to ask, you're probably going to fail. And that's the biggest. So don't fail with that. You know. So if people are wanting to start out or even thinking about whether they could do it, can, is it okay for them to ask you for connections to some of those people? By all means. Uh, my email address is gm at acresusa.com. They can call us at 1-800-355-5313. Uh, we're on, they can chat on our Facebook page. They can uh, find us on Twitter or Instagram. You know, any channel. We get questions from all sorts of channels. Uh, more than happy to, if they, especially if they're specific where I'm in this region and I'm looking for people I can use to, you know, to build my own little personal board of directors or whatever they need to do to get their farm going. Uh, we'd be more than happy to uh, uh, call on a few of our readers or advertisers or a few of our speakers and authors and, and see what we can do to help them. So what's the biggest entry barrier for those people? Is it the cost of the land to get started, do you think? Cost and access to land. So, yes, yeah, certainly, you, you know, um, how expensive land can be. Uh, yeah. As a young person without a lot of credit history, banks just don't always want to extend themselves and give them a big loan, especially um, around a, a, an organic farm specifically. Well, and if they're just starting, they don't have a way to pay back the loan anyway, right? So that, that's the biggest challenge. And, and uh, we have to figure out a safety net for those young farmers to come in. So a lot of them have a day job. They're working 40 hours a week, you know, doing, working at a bank or gro- bagging groceries or doing something or being an attorney even or whatever they, you know, they, they need to do to pay the bills. And then they're right. going out on the weekends and then nights and evenings and farming and making that the, and starting that way. And it's a heck of a hard way to start, but that's, you know, that's the right. way people are doing it. But the idea is that eventually you could just do the farm full time, right? Well, at some point you're going to have to make that choice. And at some point, like I said, it really is that, um, that, you can't take a year off, you know that, because it sets you back five or ten years at some point. And so making sure that uh, they have a plan, a program, and, and, a, and a fall back in this for the long run. Yeah, I think those are all. Uh, so there's tons of internship programs, too, mentorship programs. You know, if you're not sure and you're thinking about it, there's so many farmers who need help or, or seasonal workers. Or if you, if you drive up and knock on the door and say, I just want to learn this, I'd be shocked if they didn't figure out a way to help you get you on their farm and teach you a few things while, while you're helping them you know, feed their cows in the morning or, uh, you know, yeah. water fields or whatever needs to get done. So, wow. So there are ways to do it. And, I mean, you may have to start in difficult part, right? Doing something else for money and then gradually making it possible to do the other part. Yeah. I mean, I started my journalism and magazine and publishing career covering high school volleyball games on Friday night, you know, and covering uh-huh. the, right? You know, you start, where you, you start where you get the opportunity to start. And even though that's not where you want to end up, you, you, you take it and run with it and try to get there, right? So that's yeah, it. yeah. So really, I mean, you have so many different fields that you're trying to encourage people in. It's all under the, the heading of education, I guess. But you want to encourage young people not just to figure out the financial strategy, but if they're going to start with this challenging phase where you're doing a whole bunch of things at once, they're also going to have to put a big focus on taking care of themselves, you know, learning how to stay in good shape so they're healthy and strong with huge amounts of energy, and then they can direct it into this thing and reverse that whole trend for young people to be unhealthy now. They need to shake that off, right? I agree. I really do believe that, um, and we've, there's some truth to that. We've also done what every other generation does, right? We painted them as the, as the, as the young people, as the challenging generation, or they don't know what they're doing. And I, I really think, you know, what we can do as much too is uh, give them space, you know, as a gener- as an older generation to help. Um, we we need them so much. To they have oh, so yeah, much, and they, and they're so and they do have they have the numbers. They can actually make change happen. I know, the but they they need us to be you know try to yeah. work on ourselves to become examples too, right? Oh, totally, exactly. Well, that, and that's really what I'm talking about is instead of preaching to them, how do we yeah. show? where we'd like them to go because I know that they want to, I really do fundamentally, and this might be the end of me, but I really do fundamentally believe that every generation we do get better. And even though we know that some areas don't and, you know, civil rights takes a step back every generation or two or environmental issues take a step back. But when you look at the course of history, 
we have corrective measures that we that every generation enters into our culture, right? And they try right. to correct something from that previous generation, and they might add something that's worse, but they might you know bring in something that's that's better. So yeah. I really believe that this next generation, just because they have us so outnumbered, they can just make <laughs> it, they 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 have an opportunity to do so much good or so much bad. And so let's I really want them to. Wait, I hope that they can yeah. find the people to inspire them, like you said. Okay, well. I'm sorry to keep you so long, but there, you know, there were millions of things that I wanted to see what you thought about, and I, I think that my main point is that Acres USA is is still, after all these decades, an incredible focus of inspiration for the young people, but the old people too, and all of us are are getting a lot out of what you're doing, and I really appreciate it. And if somebody wants to subscribe, which I think would be a good idea for anybody, how do they do that? Uh, they can go to our website, acresusa.com, and they'll see a, a magazine section that they can find, learn all about our magazine and subscribe to. Or they can just give us a call again, uh, 1-800-355-5313. Uh, we run, we're open Monday to Friday, and we have people, humans, that answer the phone. Uh, you shouldn't be in any phone tree. If you call us during business hours, you'll talk to one of our cool people here, and they'll get you all they set are, up. Yeah, they are great. Okay, well, thank you, Ryan. I really appreciate it. I hope you'll stay in touch. and. Let us know when we can recommend peace, people places to buy rock dust and stuff like that, too. I will and, al- and also, I want to tell people about the farmers that you said would be willing to talk to them. That's a huge resource. By all means, that's what we do, truly. So thank you for the opportunity to be on the show. I really appreciate it. Yeah, it was fun. Talk to you soon. So there goes Ryan Slabo, everybody. Uh, our friend who's been on the show once before. I hope you enjoyed it. And, you know, some people would tend to think that agriculture is not relevant to what they're interested in. But if you eat food, it's relevant because um, you're depending on it every day. And the quality of, of the food that it produces is really important. And there's some major improvement, obviously, that has to happen in the U.S. and the world. Uh, interestingly, this is one reason that Russia has been demonized by the by our lovely media in, in the U.S. Because uh, one of President Putin's stated goals was to become the biggest exporter of organic food on the planet, and he's supporting families and giving them places to have small farms and things like that. It's a really good example for the U.S. And I would hope that the president and the people in charge of the government in the U.S. would stop this ridiculous attitude toward Russia and accept the offer, if it's still good, for an alliance where we could help each other have a healthier um, ecosystem and biosphere because it's it's still possible. I, I don't think it's too late by any means. I, I don't think it's too late at all. And what I would just encourage everybody to do is um, start on yourself. We have to all start on ourselves, me too. And um, take an inventory of what you, those small things that you do every day, um, what you're eating and drinking and breathing and uh, all the other things to do for your health, the exercise and sunlight and sleep patterns and things that are important. Upgrade your own lifestyle, um, the way you think about everything, the thoughts and emotions you have toward other people. Um, that's where it all starts. And, and I think like we were talking about with Ryan, each individual has so much potential power, healing power to do good. Um, you don't have to be in some high level position and, and uh, visible to the world. You affect the whole world anyway because of uh, what some of our guests have talked about in terms of the fact that we're all connected to each other intimately. So uh, if we want to do something on the world, doing it on yourself is not just a second choice. It's the only way to do the rest of the world. It makes whatever we're doing on the outside more powerful. Uh, Ryan's setting a great example. I hope that more young people think about going into organic agriculture. Certified or not is not the issue. Whether it's really organic and regenerative, as OCA talks about, is and the biodynamic people and everybody that's what matters, and, and it's an incredible contribution. If you're not a farmer, at least you can grow some of your own food organically, as Celeste was talking about a couple weeks ago. And um, there's so much that we can all do, and you can either look at it as, well, things are really hopeless, and it, it's too hard to do anything, or say, you know, I don't care whether they are hopeless. It just feels better to make my best contribution for every minute that I'm still here. And uh, upgrade yourself and you change the whole world, not later, but instantly. 
it's kind of exciting when you start to grasp the connection there. So it's part of the reason I wanted Ryan to come back. And uh, if you haven't seen Acres USA, take a look at it. AcresUSA.com, I believe, is the website. And there are ways to subscribe there and get uh, related news and things like that. One of the great projects that's happening in the world, you don't hear about it on TV, but all these things are still going on. And uh, there's a reason to be very encouraged by all of that. So thanks for being with us. I appreciate the time. I know you, your time is really valuable, and it's an honor to be with you. And uh, I'll look for you next time. See you soon. Mm-hmm. 